Okay, good evening. Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the second uh, annual Joe Cox Memorial Lecture. I'm Sarah Franklin. I'm the head of the Department of Sociology, and it's a real pleasure to see so many people here tonight. Um, it's an especial honor to be um, introducing this lecture this evening to family and friends and colleagues, as well as the officers and representatives of the Joe Cox Foundation. Um, and it is also, of course, a great pleasure to be back here in Murray Edwards and enjoying the um, consistent hospitality of President Barbara Stocking um, and in this very beautiful lecture theater. Um, so our department, the Department of Sociology, was very keen to establish this lecture um, in memory of the, of the pine, pioneering work that Joe did um, in so many areas, um, particularly focused on issues of social inequality. And both social inequality and social and institutional change are absolutely vital to the work of the Department of Sociology. So we're really pleased to have so many of you here tonight. Um, I will now turn to Evie Aspinall, who in addition to being the president of KUSU, the Cambridge University Students Union, is also the founder of the Joe Cox Feminist Society here at Cambridge. So who better to introduce our very distinguished speaker tonight. We're absolutely thrilled to have Catherine Pereira with us, and her topic is, I think, superbly well chosen for this occasion. So thank you very much, and over to you. Hello. Um, excuse the voice that's already going, which is a shame on this evening. Um, thank you all so much for coming. It's really great to see so many people here um, in memory of Joe Cox and discussing such an important issue. Um, Joe Cox was undoubtedly an absolute inspiration to me um, throughout my time here at Cambridge. Um, not only did I also go to Pembroke, not only did I also study the same subject in its newer version of human, social and political sciences, um, we also had very similar politics and very similar ideas. Um, and her passing genuinely had a profound effect on me. Her work on homelessness, the Syrian civil war and on women in leadership is an inspiration and an important message for us all. Um, this inspired me to create two years ago the Joe Cox Feminist Society. It's a society that meets every week. Um, once a week, one week we discuss self-care and it's a space for women and non-binary people um, to get together, have a chat, have a rant and discuss the issues that they're facing um, that week. And then the alter alternate week we have discussions. We discuss everything from intersectional feminism to um, the problems of being a woman on the internet, women in leadership. Um, and it's a really great discussion space um, for women to discuss the important issues. Um, it's primarily in, in Joe's old college in Pembroke, um, but anyone is welcome to come. Um, and I think it's a really important space for women um, and men as well who are, are willing to accept and discuss these issues. Um, but one woman who's much more qualified to talk on Joe and on all of these issues is here today um, is Catherine Pereira. Um, Catherine trained as a barrister but has now moved into the world of um, the NHS Horizons. Um, beyond that, she's also worked as a chief exec for Movement for Change um, and is generally really important in the, work, in the area of homelessness and on, on issues that, that Joe worked on. They worked together um, in the women's Labour labor Women's Work Network um, and is now they're carrying on the work in loneliness. So um, I will hand over to Catherine. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, and it's a real pleasure to be here this evening, and in particular with Joe's family here this evening with us. Pleasure. When I close my eyes and I remember Joe, I remember a young woman whose eyes danced when she smiled, which was almost constantly. She's cradling Kulin, her newborn son, in one arm as he feeds at her breast. Her other arm swoops through the air as she makes a point, as she chairs a meeting of senior politicians. She holds the meeting together with grace and with humour as we rock gently back and forward on the houseboat. 
Now, let me say that again. When I recall the Member of Parliament for Batley and Spen before her murder, I remember the River Thames, urgent politics, a beautiful baby, national leaders, decisions made, money raised, laughter and hope. These images may feel deeply incongruous. They found coherence in Jo. More than her work, it was the way that Jo chose to live as a mum, as a friend, as a gifted politician, which reconciled these inconsistencies. Unmistakably, stubbornly, she was her whole self. And it is this question of wholeness that I want to focus on tonight. And in particular, the cost to us as individuals and to our communities when we allow a situation to persist where some amongst us by reason of exclusion and prejudice and ultimately power, are unable to be our whole selves. I'm going to focus on what this looks like in terms of women in public life. And I'm going to argue that gender identity pivots loneliness. That the inability to be whole follows with inevitability the fragmentation caused by loss of power. I'm going to weave into one piece two aspects of Joe's political life. Joe called loneliness the most urgent challenge of our time. Secondly, she laid down the challenge to us to encourage more women into public office and to bestow on them equal dignity when they got there. Loneliness, women's representation, where's the link? Well, I'm gonna, ask, I'm gonna suggest to you that they have more in common than they may first appear to. I believe that in both of these things, Jo was motivated by the same challenge. The challenge to highlight imbalances of power, voicelessness, exclusion, not simply because they are social ills, but because they are political ills that we all have a role in addressing. So to my first thread, loneliness. What do I mean by loneliness? A feeling of isolation, certainly, but not the same as being alone. The long distance runner by herself from hours on end may well not be lonely. But I think we all know that the loneliest place can be in a crowd. And while loneliness undoubtedly has a physical dimension, I mean more the unwanted absence of connection with others. It's a sensation that arises because we are insufficiently close to other people. A feeling whose tone ranges from discomfort to chronic unbearable pain. Earlier this year, the BBC conducted the biggest ever study on loneliness, and it convened a number of researchers for the purpose. Let me share with you three of the key findings. First, loneliness is pervasive. A third of people in our country say that they often, or very often, feel lonely. Second, Loneliness kills. Now, this might seem a sensationalist claim, but the evidence for it is strong and growing. There's a reason why some nurseries send misbehaving toddlers alone to the na naughty corner, and why solitary confinement is used for prisoners as a form of torture. Loneliness both impacts on the physical and mental health in multiple ways. And the interplay of this is only just being understood. And we know that loneliness predicts increased morbidity and mortality, which is really just an elegant way of saying that loneliness can prove fatal. Third, loneliness defies stereotype. 55,000 people took part in the BBC convened research, and it found that 16 to 24-year-olds 
are the loneliest age group. This doesn't appear to be an anomaly. Much of the data from other studies supports it, although it may at first seem surprising. Some people attribute this to the rise of the smartphone, and there is an important narrative about disconnection in a connected age. Yet in the same study, looking back, older people said that young adulthood was the time that they felt loneliest. Perhaps it's not modern life which is making many young people feel lonely. Perhaps this was always the loneliest phase of life. And Joe at that age, Joe who had an extraordinary ability for creating and maintaining friendships, she felt lonely in this place. Her public image was of a cheerfully confident and outgoing professional. Yet she talked of how profoundly isolating surroundings of privilege were for a young lass from Yorkshire and a normal family. And I remember one night we shared stories together of how overwhelming a sense of imposter syndrome can be when we step into a world that is not historically our own. And it's this point that brings me to my second thread. Loneliness is a, a near universal condition, but I make no apology for suggesting that it affects women in particular ways. So loneliness is gendered, you say. That may surprise you. Kids are lonely. Men are lonely. And when I say that it affects women in particular ways, I'm not asserting that our experience is exclusive. If you're here tonight and you're black and or Asian, if you have a disability, if you're gay, if you have a condition, medical or otherwise, which remains stigmatised, then what, much of what I say may resonate with you. With all that said, please allow me to, to speak to the question of women most directly and to suggest, through the prism of women's experience, the particular strands of loneliness that can occur. Now, we know that loneliness often occurs at points of life transition, and many of these transitions still disproportionately impact women, like pregnancy, childbirth, and the surprising isolation that can occur in its wake. Stuck at home with a small baby who naturally cannot reciprocate. When life at times felt empty for me, and I was embarrassed by its thinness. Like the menopause, and other times when our bodies force us to recognise that we must let go of one way of being and acquire a new and perhaps unwelcome identity. Let me put it like this. Gender identity pivots loneliness. Let me push further with a second strand. The feelings of loneliness prompted by objectification. How heavy the burden can be to carry a woman's body, or rather everything that attaches to it. The isolation that can occur when expectations of my identity are defined and projected onto me by others. <coughs> there is a gaze, known, I think, to all women, which Olivia Lang describes in her wonderful book, The Lonely City. It's a gaze which is manifested in the so-called harmless cleavage shots of women sitting on the green benches of the House of Commons. Small markers, trivial in isolation, on which the imposter syndrome feeds. This is not made for me. I am not made for it. I believe that all women are subject to that gaze, subject to having it applied or withheld. The dislocation, the feelings of loneliness that such objectification provokes are known to us individually, as well as seen as a group, as a sex. And if I were to think on my moments of loneliness to describe its effect in my life, I would have to admit that some of it at least 
comes from feelings of anxiety around my appearance, about being found insufficiently desirable, deep-rooted, difficult to dislodge. For those who doubt how universal this is, think only of the Me Too movement. That roar of Me Too is powered by the spectacle of women being steered into the ongoing, non-consensual beauty pageant of femininity, of being made to confront our status as an object that may or may not be deemed acceptable, capable of arousing the eye the sense that one can only be accepted by dressing up as something else. And as we age, the sense that we may be running short on what remains for women, a chief currency of exchange, a feeling of loss that has to do with unattainable standards of appearance and that gets increasingly toxic and strangulating with age. Gender identity pivots loneliness. Let me talk on power, how imbalances of power experienced by women create conditions in which loneliness can thrive. And again, you know, the research supports this. <coughs> study after study has demonstrated that those who feel discriminated against are more likely to describe as lonely. I think it stands to reason. This in itself is a tragic realization because it implies that when we exclude, when we constrain people's ability to be seen, to be whole, we give those who need and most long for the connection to others reasons to fear and mistrust. And the problem is compounded because loneliness remains so stigmatized. There is a shame to admit to feelings that are so counter to the lives that we are supposed to lead. And so discussing loneliness and its relationship with power and exclusion becomes increasingly inadmissible, unless, <coughs> unless we break that cycle. Now I want to bring together two aspects of Joe's political life that I introduced at the beginning, linking loneliness to women <coughs> and our representation in public life. The history of female representation is a story of too slow progress in the face of pers persistent barriers. Now, this is true in all professions to varying degrees, of course. I often tell the story of my grandmother, Nan McGonagall. Nan McGonagall was a fierce Ulster woman, very smart. About this big, you didn't mess. <coughs> and she, in the 1930s, graduated near the top in the whole of Ireland in her bar exams. Nan worked her whole career as a legal secretary, Catholic, Irish in Northern Ireland, and a woman. And I do believe that me becoming a barrister was some attempt to right that wrong. And in my own practice, taking a complex judicial review case to the High Court as the sole counsel, I recall being described by one judge as a good little lawyer. <coughs> Yet how can I claim that female representatives remain particularly isolated? The most senior judge in the country is a woman, the commissioner of the Met, the head of the National Crime Agency, the London Fire Brigade. At Holyrood, a female leader debates against a female opposition leader. The two largest parties in Northern Ireland are led by women. The leaders of the House of Commons, the House of Lords, they're both women, as is Blackrod and, of course, the <coughs> current Prime Minister. <laughs> For those who say that we've moved so far, we're equal. We should forget about past stigmas and historic injustice. Please think on this. On the 8th of December, 2016, nearly 100 years after the first woman was elected to parliament, the 455th woman was elected to the House of Commons. 
And on that same day, there were 455 men sitting in the House of Commons. It had taken us 98 years for the number of women who have ever been elected to equal the number of men sitting in the Commons on a single day. Change does come, but it's never in a hurry. The vote for women was such a cornerstone issue because it spoke to far wider exclusions. Suffrage is not simply, of course, about the right to vote, but about what that vote represents, the basic human fundamental right of being able to participate in the choices for our future and that of our communities. With just 32% of parliamentarians drawn from the majority of our population, women, we remain on the cusp of that promise. And while the profile of a handful of women suggests wider parity, they are an anomaly. Nancy Astor, who was the first woman to take her seat in the, Houses of, in the House of Commons, once said, Pioneers may be picturesque figures, but they are often rather lonely ones. And many of those first pioneers were not elected in their own right, but because of what they, through the men in their family, <coughs> represented. Mabel Philipson, Gwendolyn Guinness, Hilda Runciman, Ruth Dalton, Agnes Hardy, Beatrice Wright, extraordinary women whose job was to hold the seat until a brother could relinquish his peerage, or a husband could escape from a marginal seat and take over. Women who were fondly referred to as bed warmers. The later pioneers consistently selected for marginal seats, unwinnable seats, whose political breaks often came because no man thought the seat was winnable, so they didn't put themselves forward. And those who are still trying to push their way to that table now it seems often selected to stand against another woman in a marginal seat. I could talk of Irene Ward and Margaret Bonfield in 1931. I could just as easily talk of Sarah Owen and Amber Rudd in 2015. The bravery that it takes to break through these dominant narratives and the isolation that can follow in its wake. Let's not forget that for most of our history, no woman who aspired to succeed in Labour Party politics could take up the cause of women. The political contest remained framed as a fight between capital and Labour, with mirror constraints applying in the opposite party political direction. Personally, I'll never forget the advice that I received from Barbara Follett, MP, she told me to always wear jackets with full shoulder pads. <laughs> and at the time, I thought this was really dodgy 80s fashion advice. <laughs> Later, I realised that it spoke to how she thought about the slightness of her frame, that so-called gravitas has a physical dimension, a physicality which is decidedly male. And the message I heard was, Wear that jacket as a piece of armour, as a mask. There is a freedom conveyed in masks. Do I remake myself as the other in their view of what a politician should be, yet in that trade-off lose a piece of myself? And herein is the dilemma that led a friend of mine, a female MP, to tell me that she has the loneliest job in the world. So why do I dwell on this? Many women believe that talking about the differences between men and women, quote, sets women back. I know that that's a school of thought. Invited in 1968 to celebrate the 50th anniversary of women winning the vote, Barbara Castle wrote, quote, Preparing my speech was agony because I am too busy exercising my emancipation to have time to think about it. <laughs> yes. But I might counter by quoting the indomitable Jess Phillips MP who said, quote, to make me feel guilty for speaking publicly about the things I care about is a classic way of trying to shut me up. Uh, and it hasn't succeeded with Jess to date. 
I dwell on this recent past because it reaches so directly into our present and into our future. There can be a tendency today among young women to look at politics and perhaps expect a level playing field. And when that plan doesn't survive contact with reality, I see too many young women internalise as their own individual personal failing any feeling of exclusion or prejudice they may have. A mere glimpse at the context tells a different story. The surge in crimes against MPs in the last year, reported in The Guardian last month, reveals abuse which often has a misogynist character. And meanwhile, last month, Dame Laura Cox delivered a report on bullying and harassment in Parliament, which describes, quote, a corrosive culture in which bullying and harassment, in particular of women, has become normalised. Dame Laura Cox's report outlined the, quote, deference, subservience, acquiescence, and silence, which have enabled that culture to thrive and the abuse to be tolerated and concealed. After Jo's death, her sister Kim said Jo did so much in the first half of her life and she would have achieved so much more in the second half that there is a responsibility by those of us who loved Jo and knew her to pick up where she left off. Well, I loved Jo. So, let's get practical. Before I conclude, I want to give us a sense not just of who we are, but of who we can be next. Joe's close friend, Kirsty McNeil, described Joe as having one arm wrapped around your shoulder while the other pushed you forward. It's a wonderful image, isn't it? This is not simply a matter of raising awareness. It's about how we put that knowledge into effect that makes the difference. On loneliness generally, there are small things that we can all do in our lives. Alex Smith runs something called the Cares Family. It's a social enterprise which challenges loneliness by bringing young people and older people together for social events. And Alex put it like this. We've prioritised what is efficient over what is important. I think his insight calls on us to fight that urge we have to maintain constant and superficial contact with others, to see and be seen. When you find yourself touching base or making an appearance or giving brief remarks, stop it. Those tools that we buy to maintain superficial contact in our pockets, at our desks. Beware that they do not become a tyranny of technology in your life. Remember, as the great community organiser Michael Geekin once said, that all real life is meeting, not meetings. And that starting a conversation every day in your neighbourhood can be a radical act of community service. Make tackling loneliness your business day to day. If you buy a coffee, start by talking to the person who made it. Simple, one step at a time. And there are small acts of political service which we can also render day to day. Students here, who's a student? Hey, academics, geographers, sociologists, historians. I ask you this, whose work do you cite in your essays and your articles? Those of us who have platforms to speak from, big or small, whose words do we elevate? Ask yourself, in other words, what small adjustments can you make to create the conditions for more women to be heard? If there's a woman you admire in public life, Tell her to keep going. And if you know a woman who's thinking about standing for office, wrap one arm around her shoulder and with the other push her forward. 
ask her to stand and create the conditions that enable her to do so. Unless we act now, we will never as Dawn Butler MP once memorably joked, achieve an equal number of rubbish male and female MPs. <laughs> and when the space is there for the taking, please take it. If you're a woman who rarely speaks in public but you want to give it a go, ask me a question tonight. Make a comment. We have power, the ability to act, what Martin Luther King called the ability to achieve purpose together. We sit here in one of the most powerful institutions in the world. And I say that not to congratulate us, I say it to challenge us. And reason said to her, silence, what do you hear? And she said, I hear the sound of feet a thousand times, ten thousands and thousands and thousands, and they beat this way. They are the feet of those that follow you. Lead on. I cannot end without returning to Jo. If she were here this evening in person, I think she would be thrilled and humbled in equal measure. Catherine Atkinson, the new chief executive of the Joe Cox Foundation, recently put it like this. She would have shared in the satisfaction of how far we have come while refusing to be daunted by the distance we still have to go. But she's not here in person. It's us. When Joe died, her family said that she would not have wanted to rest in peace. There is still so much to do. And now this is our challenge. And now this is our choice. The woods are lovely, dark and deep. But we have promises to keep and miles to go before we sleep. We have miles to go before we sleep. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine, for a genuinely moving and really important speech, which I think we can all take a lot from. There are so many things we can each do day to day which will genuinely make a difference on this. Um, so we now have about 40 minutes, um, which we can open up to the floor to questions. So does anyone want to start us off? Anyone? It's always the scary bit being the first person. <laughs> yes, over there. All right, thank you. Haley Rice from here in Murray Edwards College. Um, I'm part of the public policy uh, master's program here, actually. And one of our first days when we were all having a, you know, get to meet you session at a pub after class, there was a bunch of the women there. And we said, so who among us is actually thinking of getting into politics? And the answer was absolutely no one. Mm. And I mean, some of us have worked in public policy before, and one person said, I'd rather be the Huma Abedin than the Hillary Clinton, you know, the person behind. Um, so what would you say to a group of people that is all doing something that could lead you into politics, but, you know, their reasons were not wanting to get their lives torn apart? I mean, mm. what would you say to the, the women in my cohort? So I'm also going to invite other people to help me with answers. If you have a burning answer to a question that you hear, also raise your hand, because else it's going to be a heck of a lot of you talking. <laughs> Um, I struggle with that as a question. I think it's a great question, but I struggle with the answer because I sit here as somebody who has stood for Parliament and has not stood since and stood in a seat that was unwinnable. So um, unlike Joe in my hometown, very conservative, 
Um, I had £93 for my election fund. I had three wonderful <coughs> men all over the age of 70 who were my team. <laughs> and, um, and I did it to see if it was, to genuinely see if it was something that I wanted for myself. When I did it, um, five days before the general election, the English Defence League came and staged a march in the town. And I'm pleased to say that nearly ten times as many people came out to the mosque um, to hold a kind of day vigil as, uh, as people turned up for the march. But it was an intimation of some of the issues that have crept into the politics, which I'm alluding to here. Um, and one line from what I said was, we've got to go in with our eyes sufficiently wide open that, they, that our plans survive contact with reality. Um, something Joe and I used to talk about when we were training women to stand for the council and parliament was, we build them up and build their sense of confidence, but we're not sure that we're building them up in a way that's going to survive contact. And it was a, it was a problem. So I know I'm not kind of getting it at it directly, but I'm acutely conscious I'm a woman who is deeply political, but is expressing my politics through a different form of public service. And I feel very conflicted about it. I feel keenly the challenge that Jo put down in terms of her life and her choices, but I'm not going to sit here and say that it's an easy thing to do. What I would say is, as a party political representative who takes government, you have power, unconstrained ability to act that is not true of any other profession. Um, and I use power in a neutral sense, not good, not bad, but the simple fact of being able to act to achieve change is unparalleled. Um, and I think unless we have people entering that space who are conflicted by that prospect, we are going to continue to get bad politics. Any more questions? First of all, thank you very much for including lots of different people you've talked about. I was struck, my name is Tim Leach, sorry, I'm a chief executive of a charity called Wavelength. Um, probably the oldest loneliness and isolation charity in the, in the country. Um, and there's a couple of things I want to talk to you about, actually. But first of all, I want to reflect on something you started to say, which was you were including a lot of other people within the gender politic, and by which I mean disabled people, other people who feel disenfranchised. Um, and one of the things I will say, one of my pivotal people with my life was the Vice Chancellor um, of York University, a remarkable lady called Jane Grenville, who's now head of the archaeology department. And she knew I was a disabled student, and she said, you should be here, Tim, and the purpose of me is to back you. And part of the struggle about, is about equality, and part of the equality is making sure each time you lose, I lose. And when we understand that dynamic, we all come one to actually bring that change for a better, better world. Now, I, I kind of listened to you tonight talk about very much a political perspective. And I think one of the things I, I know about Jo is that she was able to strip away the politics and bring people together. Um, and I think that's something which I would ask you to reflect on is that possible? Is a you know you're serving your life in a different perspective? How can the rest of us do that? How do we take it forward? And what are your sort of thoughts upon that analysis? Yeah, thank you for that contribution. Firstly, um, forgive me, I didn't want to open this while you were talking, but I'm just going to pour myself some water. <coughs> I think this might even be being recorded, so you don't really want me glug glugging over your question. <laughs> um, What do I think about it? So I think you're right. I think one of the gifts that Jo had was in, um, not just as I alluded to, reconciling parts of her identity, but seeing, um, 
seeing a wholeness to her politics, which was not predominantly party political. I mean, she wasn't tribally. You know, she, she it's, a bit, it's a bit like me. I, I, I probably found the Labour Party because I'm Irish and Catholic and communitarian and contrary. Um, and it felt like a good home rather than it being a narrow ideological base from which I would not deviate. Um, and I think that sort of politics or understanding of the world is more needed now than ever. Um, I think we see that in, I'm avoiding the B word, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> Continue. Um, but we see that in the current moment that we have, that, that Brexit symbolises. Right? And I think if I can say by extension, my perspective would be that what happened with Joe, both good and bad in terms of the legacy that is being created and what people are taking Joe to symbolise in our polity, that is part of that moment too. What I do think is that we can do more to develop the, the infrastructure, if I can put it that way, that allows that transformation of public institutions to happen, to develop more leadership, which is, as you put it, about a, a whole perspective, not an economic perspective, not a political perspective, but actually a perspective based in some understanding of humanity, the human condition. That's probably what excites me most about my work in the NHS now, that much of it is about trying to shift the way that people think about what we are capable of and see public service as something far wider than an institution or an idea or a narrow interest. I'm not sure I have an answer on it now. But I think the more people that are asking the question and doing it in public, the more chance we have to grapple with an answer together. Does anybody else want to say anything on that? I can't help it, I'm a facilitator. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, yeah, a little bit on that, I suppose, and if I've understood it correctly, because I'm not an academic, I'm a sort of working grassroots sections, and I suppose I'm thinking about how I like the idea of the infrastructure and the platforms and the idea of that being more possible. But for example, yesterday in my work, I'm a nurse and I was going to seek funding for one of my patients for accommodation in um, a panel of um, commissioners who were all men um, and I became the funding looked like it was going to be rejected and I became I would say passionate and the chair of the panel said to me there's no need to get upset and reached his arm a little bit in my direction at which point I started to cry <laughs> because I was angry <coughs> and that's how I react when I'm angry that's my nature that's maybe to do with biologically my gender and I came away actually got the funding I <laughs> 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 have since recommended to my colleagues that turning on the tears is effective because uh, <laughs> these men are obviously weak for that but it was really humiliating and I suppose listening to you say about the, uh, these ideas of the infrastructure I was kind of feeling like well what do I do when I'm faced with those situations? And I suppose that's not necessarily a question to be answered, but yes. a comment on what it feels like at that level. Yes. So. Yeah. Um, what I referred to slightly tongue in cheek is the, the small markers trivial in isolation and yet how they can feel and how they affect our ability to act and be who we might feel that we are. Hi, um, from grassroots to academic, I was struck by you saying that 
Um, I'm actually a PhD student in history, and so I was struck by you saying in our various disciplines we can open a space for women's voices. And the way that I see it, there are kind of two ways that come to mind as an historian. One is telling women's stories, which obviously is quite difficult given the archival um, absences. Um, and the other <coughs> is by citing other female historians, but in some instances there is a, a complete absence of them as well in specific yeah. areas. And so I was wondering if you could reflect on um, ways that you think academics can open up those spaces, even in community, like academic practice more formally, but yeah. also in terms of like academic culture? That's a great question. Um, let me tell you a little story. Every December, I have a great privilege. I get to go to Florida for a big annual conference for the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. So these are some of the leading people in the world who are thinking about how we improve healthcare systems globally. And we come together and we share views. And last December, I was sat with a group of six women. We kind of convened our own mini-meeting, um, ostensibly to talk about something which we were sort of, but we were also having lots of cake and mulling over and chewing the fat. And we got to talking about this very question. What the heck do you do when in healthcare improvement, there are lots of voices to quote, but they are mainly men. And we mulled it over and we were talking about it. And at one point, Kate uh, said, why don't we start quoting each other? <laughs> I was like, That's interesting. Tell me something that you've said. Well, why don't I just say something? <laughs> so this is what we started doing. So we started a little club. So there's six of us in our club, but if you're involved in healthcare improvement, you're welcome to join. <laughs> And we have a wee database of quotes. And I love just popping them up on slides. So I have a slide that Martin Luther King says that power is the ability to achieve, pur to achieve purpose. Kate Hilton says, <laughs> why not, right? I mean, this is the thing. We often think about knowledge as codified over decades and centuries. And there is a rigor in that. And there is a respect. And my first degree was history. So I do understand. I respect that body of knowledge. But where we are faced with this paradox, this dilemma, around gaps in the formal record, there are small things we can do to change the narrative, to move the picture. So I do think it is about, maybe as you suggest, a different way of doing history. It's also, um, I was revisiting E.H. Carr's wonderful book, What is History? Right? Historiography 101. And it's, it's wonderful, but it's so dated. I would love to pick up just a short essay from a woman. What is history? That takes some of the essence of that and applies it to the historical discipline or the sociological discipline. And then we create conditions where we amplify that voice, where we spread it through social media, through Twitter, through events like this, through micro, fractal conversations, water cooler conversations, as well as formal narratives. And through that process, we can affect the way that we think. And that affects how we behave. And through that process, we affect how others think and behave too. Um, I guess this is sort of linked to what we've been talking about, but I was just wondering how we could combat the idea that women shouldn't take up space in sort of public forums, like talk, speaking publicly, um, even asking this question, it was quite nerve wracking, I had to really build, you know. So I just wondered if you've got any sort of practical tips, I suppose, and also theory on sort of how we can combat that idea that women shouldn't take yeah. up space. Um, I facilitated a big group of social workers, mental health social workers, all aged between 20 and 30, start of their career, about a month ago. And um, there was an academic who was observing it for research. And at the end, I said, you know, I'd love 10 minutes of your time to get some feedback. And it's a room that was 80% women, 20% men. But I had been very conscious throughout the day that most of the contributions had been from the men in the room. And he said to me, did you, did you observe that? And I said, yes. <laughs> well, what do I do about it? And he said, well, you know, there's lots of ways, but there's two things. The first is for you as a person who has a position to acknowledge it, which provides this, this interesting idea of permission. And I use that in inverted commas. But this interesting idea of some form of external, extrinsic permission for women to act in different ways. 
And he said, the other thing you could do, and I was on the edge of my seat, is yes. Just tell the men to shut up. <laughs> but do it in a kind way. So ask people to think about how much contribution have you made into the room, all of us, to think about that, and then think about whether we need your contribution in the next part of the session. Do it in an inclusive way. So I do say it to our male <coughs> friends, I say it tongue in cheek. Because I think it is a challenge for all of us, but the evidence would suggest that it does disproportionately impact on people who are perhaps less cultured, inculcated, into raising our voice in a public way. Um, and I, I still feel that. You know, I, I had great privilege. I went to Oxford. I went to the bar. I you know, was in politics. And yet when I go to a venue in Whitehall and I do the long walk down the staircase of dead white men on the wall and I feel this big by the bottom. It's a tangible feeling. So it's about not underestimating the physicality of space and the physicality of the intimidation of that physicality for people who may not be adjusted to using their voice. I can't bear it anymore. Um, I need to say something. Um, sorry, I'm Barbara Stocking and I'm from Murray Edwards College, but I just wanted to say something about some work that we're doing in the college about um, really trying to wait, change the workplace culture to make it possible for women to really succeed in it in their own right. And, and I was just interested in the, the whole business. One of the things that we've got out of a lot of our research in a lot of companies and government actually, is the thing that really gets women all the time is either being talked over in meetings um, or or having their words put into a man's mouth, um, which how many people have experienced that? A lot. Anyway, but the, the thing I was going to just put on the table is I, one of the bits we picked up, and I was really impressed by, and it was your word amplification. There's the story of um, uh, Barack Obama's White House, and that all the women there got really fed up, despite there being quite a lot of them, because he put a lot of them in the White House. They were still not being listened to at all. So they actually ran a, a whole scheme of amplification, so that whenever a woman said something, another woman would then pipe up with the same thing and said, you know, as Catherine said a minute ago, um, that, what a good idea, et cetera, and, and, and really replaying it back all the time. And um, I, that just seemed to be like a nice way to go through it in a very polite and nice way, mm. but actually really getting women's voice heard. So any more things you can think about <laughs> that would make women's voice heard better? In, or, and, and actually, not just women's voice. It's back to your same thing. It's not just women. It's anybody yeah. who's disempowered. Yeah. Um, a man in, this, in one of the workshops we had said to me, Barbara, I don't know why you're worried about this, because this is what we do to inferior men as well. Um, <laughs> that's an interesting comment, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but anyway, that, so I'd just be interested a, a bit more, and if, if you want to say a bit more about how we get women's voice heard, if you've yes. got any further thoughts. Yes, but, Gus, I'll uh, wrap my brain. That's a brilliant <coughs> example. Amplification is a good example. Um, let me throw that open while I think for a second. Let, why don't we crowdsource some? I was going to say, I've, I've got a good one. In the, um, so at university, I go sit on the university council at the moment, and it's predominantly white men. Um, and I thought there was a really interesting thing they did one day, which was the strategic away day. And we got into small groups. And suddenly the women spoke. And normally I go to university council and I notice every time that the only women that really speak are me and the graduate union president who haven't been quite brainwashed into not speaking yet. And we just say whatever we think. But it was that day when we broke into small groups, the women had so much to say. Mm -hmm. And it's actually the environment that you sit in that can change things. So in a very formalised setting where everything you say counts and everyone's listening, there was women who didn't, didn't seem to speak, but actually in smaller groups, they had lots to say. And the same sort of things, like in sitting in, an ampli in a theatre like this, it can be more intimidating to speak. But if you're sat, like, all physically on a living, level playing field, in a circle, that kind of thing, yes. different people will come forward, which I think is important to think yeah. about. And again, research would support that. So in facilitation, we refer to that as one to all, which is we rarely start off as we did tonight. This was you know, quite a formal, mm. where it's all. We go straight to all. In facilitation, we tend to use, we start with you reflecting individually. You have a conversation in a pair. You maybe pair up with some others, and then you bring it into the room. And that process in itself can allow multiple layers of people contributing. Um, the other thing to say, because I, I was being tongue-in-cheek, is you know, men in the room are, uh, I think, the biggest, biggest allies for making some of this happen, both in taking the time to reflect and think about it, 
um, and in having conversations, uh, creating stories, spreading stories about the change, etc. Um, I, don't, I don't see this as an us and them, and, and it's one of the tensions in giving a lecture that is about women's experience, that this is a question as, I think, is it Tim? You said it's a question of wholeness, yeah, a holistic look, rather than a, an isolation, and I think that applies both ways. Um, just to add another, um, my name is Iona, and I uh, used to run the Joe Cox Foundation before Catherine much more ably took over. Um, and, and don't do um, stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I can say that because she's my friend. And, um, <laughs> Uh, one thing that Joe, I observed Joe being very good at and that I experienced in my own way and have heard uh, particularly from younger women that I mentor or even don't even formally mentor, just hang out with, um, is partly it's a deeply powerful thing to give someone the vote of confidence, which is to say that you're not a participant, you're an actor, you're not an observer, you're a, you're a speaker. Um, and I think one of the most powerful things that you can do in the way that I think Barbara was perhaps asking, and which Joe was very good at, is give up your power if you have it, give yes. up some of your platform to other women, and in doing so, explicitly say to them, this is yours for the taking. And, um, you know, young women as young as 17 or 18 are, are people that I've encouraged to speak at large events where alongside me and various other things because so many of us who now have a, a voice and have found a platform know what it was like to feel uh, in that moment like you're the person that has a right to be there mm -hmm. and that is that's incredibly material and incredibly I, I felt like it's a very physical emotion and it's a physical sensation and you should do everything you can in order to give women behind or below or around you that sensation because the more it happens the more of a right you feel like you have to be in that space yes. and Joe was brilliant at that she was amen amen to that <laughs> um, one comment on that is um, you know, this is about also theories of power. And what interests me about that as an idea is we're talking about relational theories of power. So a relational theory of power is that power is infinite. You know, I have it. It's not that I have it and I give it to you. It's that I have it and we have it together. And it grows exponentially as we share our ability to act. It's very different to the dominant narrative about power, I think, in our culture, which is predominantly transactional. You know, I have it, I can give it, then I don't have it anymore. Um, and that's not been my experience either. Um, lots of the problems are uh, also through young children as well, for example, social media and stuff like that. And I was wondering if you thought that um, colleges and schools had a duty or responsibility to open that up and sort those issues out. <laughs> I was going to ask you what you think about that. Do you want to say? Um, <laughs> personally, I think schools are very much academically orientated and not so much, like you were saying, building women up, hitting like the wall of reality. And I don't think that's talked about enough in schools. Mm -hmm. So I know we have some teachers in the room, so kind of stick your hand up if you want to, to make a comment on it. Um, I, see, I see schools recognising it more. Um, and at events that I do, I see it being pushed as a priority more. That the link between what I refer to as um, standards of appearance, or you know, in all senses of appearance, um, being so counter to the life that we often lead in its messy reality, and the tension that that throws up, the, the disconnect, um, and how difficult that is for young people to deal with. I think that's recognised, at least in my world in the NHS, as an increasing challenge, which is a mental health challenge, and therefore by definition is a physical health challenge. Um, and therefore by extension, we're dealing with it too late if we're dealing with its health consequences. Um, I do wonder whether we put a lot of onus on schools for <coughs> complex issues. You know, increasingly the issues that we're asking schools to deal with, they're not complicated. You know, something that's complicated is lots of different processes, but if I work out the process, I can apply a solution and the problem's fixed. 
These are complex problems. They're the interplay of multiple systems. Um, they're the interplay of the effect on mental well-being of air pollution, as well as poor parenting, as well as marketing, as well as expectations of femininity. And that's a lot for a school to hold. So I think of it as a, a whole community issue, which, which again, for me, throws it back into what I would say is political um, as much as anything else. Yeah. Do any teachers want to say anything about that? I'm not a teacher, but um, I deal with um, selection of people to lead boards, and I'm terribly interested in the subject of unconscious bias, mm -hmm. both in the interviewee and the interviewer. Have you much experience of unconscious bias training and whether or not it works, either for the interviewee or the interviewer? That's a good question. Um, I, when I left the law, <coughs> A little story. Uh, when I left the law, I, uh, I started... So the reasons I left the law were because I didn't want to litigate as black and white things that I thought were grey. And I was interested in how you create change on issues. And one of the things that happened to me was I googled a combination of words that was around workplace culture, law, making a difference, bias. And I came up with this organisation called Berndeen which is a small boutique consultancy. And I called them up, and Matt Dean, who is the founder, um, answered the phone. And it was as though he had been expecting my call. <laughs> Explained who I was. He says, yes, yes, of course. Are we meeting for coffee tomorrow? And we met for coffee, and I started doing some consulting work <coughs> with them. And um, much of that work was around this question of unconscious bias, and what they refer to as my shadow the things that I can see, the things that I can't, in the shadow that I cast within my workplace or my context or my organisation. And I think it's a very powerful idea. Um, and, and, it, and it is partly why I say in my lecture that raising awareness is not enough. It's what we do to act on the awareness that we create. So um, unconscious bias... Um, just assuming everyone knows what that is. It's, it's sort of the idea that we have working in our mind in ways that we are not fully aware of, prejudice, prejudice or bias or proclivities. And the, the evidence from where I'm sitting is indisputable that this exists as a problem. So awareness is the first step to creating the conditions where you can tackle it. But it's not enough in itself. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just going to, um, first of all, I'm going to say hi. I'm Kim, I'm Joe's sister. Um, and I just want to say hi and thank you everybody for coming this evening. Um, but one thing that I just want to share with everybody that, that a lot of you are probably not aware of is that when Joe was a kid, and mum and dad are here so they can testify to this, um, she was actually really shy, really shy, quite painfully shy, wasn't she? Um, and I was the gobby one, which I know is difficult to believe. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but I, you know, so, so what I guess what I'm saying in comments to some of the, the younger women in the room who've, who've said things is that Jo went on a very long journey to get to where she got to, um, without sounding like she was on the X Factor, but she did. She, <laughs> she really went, you know, she really, she worked bloody hard to get that confidence. It's not always easy. It's not always easy and it's not always there naturally, but she sort of worked for you know, I would say a good 20 years building that and developing that. So I think even if you sit there thinking, oh, I could never do that, I could never do that. Jo did it. Jo did that journey. She, you know, she is a, a fr from, from when we were kids and, and me having to ring up for the bus timetable and order the takeaway because she genuinely dared do it, <coughs> you know, to speaking in the House of Commons. That's a massive, massive achievement, isn't it? So I think, you know, if you're the sort of person who doesn't speak out and doesn't get your voice heard and stuff, don't, that it's not like that forever. It doesn't have to be like that forever. You can make your voice heard whenever you feel uh, the need. And when you're doing that, that girl there said, channel Joe. Channel Joe and go, right, what would Joe do? She's like, I'm getting my voice heard here. You know, and, and, and she really would. She really would. And, and I'm not saying that's easy, but, but I think, you know, think about Joe's story rather than just her being in, in the House of Commons or wherever. Yes. Uh, and that might help. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> there, yeah. 
Could I continue, I hate to do this, but continue the question about unconscious uh, bias, and I dislike doing this because it was such a wonderful intervention. And I'd like to make this general in the sense that I don't want to specifically tell you about my experience, but I'm going to mention general, which is I belong to a rather large society that makes elections and finds positions frequently. And before every meeting, we're shown from a very famous psychologist a movie about how to not allow unconscious uh, bias to uh, influence and say something about it. But it never says what we should do. It just says what we shouldn't do. And while, of course, I have no unconscious bias whatsoever, <laughs> <laughs> I sit there thinking, if I dislike this person because their brother once hit me in a football game, what do I actually do? How do I balance that? Yeah. I shouldn't vote for them just because I dislike them. That's clearly not right. <laughs> um, and there's no mention about what to do. So I don't have a complete answer to that, but I do think it's a beautiful segue into um, questions around diversity, which is a misunderstood often word, um, which would be to say this, that when I'm sat on a board, if I'm sat with a lot of other reasonably privileged white professional women, um, unconscious bias by definition is unconscious, unless you try to elevate it, so it's difficult to guard against. And we all share some of the same blind spots. So our ability in and of ourselves as individuals, but as a whole, is constrained. Our decision making is the poorer because we don't have multiple perspectives. And so one suggestion, not a complete suggestion, but one suggestion to the sort of scenario you're raising is to look around and think, not me individually, but us as a corporate, are we creating the ability to see from multiple perspectives? And that's not just an individual question, I think. That's a question of who we are together and how we can compensate for each other's perspectives as well as amplify perspectives when they're needed. What would others say? Iona, did you? Yeah, I, I would also say the only no, it's, um, the only places and spaces I've ever found that have gone some way to, as Catherine very eloquently put it, see some of the blind spots are places that are distinctly un-British in their culture. Mm. So they're organisations or businesses or even families or friendship circles where um, it is deemed to be courageous to speak out and speak against the corporate, um, not, not as an act of defiance, but as an act of um, like explicit feedback. You know, These are the sorts of places where if you make someone feel a certain way in a meeting from what you've said, they feel comfortable and safe enough to come and tell you that that's how they felt. And it's those same cultures that mean that the, some of the unconscious biases are outed, not just because you have different perspectives in the room, but you have a culture of speaking up and speaking out, and that is deemed to be an important uh, but also safe thing to do. Mm -hmm. But I think that institutions, cultures, organisations, businesses, infrastructure that we create doesn't have that embedded in it, and it takes firm leadership and sort of buy-in from all stakeholders to create the spaces where people feel that they can say that I've done, I've, mm -hmm. like, their opinion, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I think that point there, yeah. Um, thank you very much. I thought that was very inspiring and I just want to touch on the idea of bias or stereotype. And as you can hear, I do have an accent. I'm, I'm from Brazil. and But I also have been involved with the Labour Party for four years now. And one thing that I notice a lot is that despite me going out canvassing, have been going out canvassing <coughs> for the last five years, have applied to the Women in Leadership programme, still waiting for my response. Um, <laughs> My first supervision in this university, politics supervision, the supervisor went around saying, oh, I bet that every single one of you here wants to be involved in politics, except for you, Lara. I was like, oh, okay. So I keep receiving stereotypes from people that just think that I want to be, want to be involved in politics, despite the objective fact that it is out there that I am involved in politics already, that I'm doing all of that. I've got a lanyard here that says Labour Party. <laughs> And that still doesn't prove that that's a career for me. And 
honestly, like, I don't know what else I could do to show that that's something for me. So I'd just like to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Sure. Um, so I'm not sure I have, I have thoughts on the particular circumstance, but I, I think the older I get, the less I give a, um, about what people think. And I mean that actually as a profound point rather than a flippant point. The older I get, the more I feel time on my back. I feel time on my back and not a long time to make the changes that I want to make. Um, so I would say keep on going because there's something in complexity theory called the attractor principle. And it works like this. You do good things, other people come. It's like a magnet. It's like the energy that Joe had. You know, she did good things and other people were attracted to it. And through that you build the feet and thousands of feet. So keep doing what you're doing and do it with a smile. And the people who understand that will come and give you support. We'll give you support. At the back. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you for the talk today. It was, uh, like I said, you know, very inspiring. Uh, I think it's a continuation of the question you know, that was earlier asked on stereotypes, particularly with women in politics. So um, I think a few weeks back, I'd attended a Cambridge Union uh, talk, which was, um, I think the guest was Hillary Clinton's um, campaign manager. So they'd invited him to talk. And there was a very interesting question um, asked to him in the audience, which was basically, um, you know, specifically on her campaign and how she was made to look you know, less emotional, very stoic, very cold. Um, and what made you know they made her to work within a particular stereotype or sometimes even against the stereotype um, so that you know people could vote for her and he'd admitted it he you know in his response he basically said um, yeah you know we made her in certain instances work within a gender stereotype you know made, made her look more caring as women generally are you know the the narrative was servicing people etc and sometimes the stereo you know we made her work against the stereotype as well and i've and i've kind of read up, up you know read up on it after i came back and how you know something as trivial as the colors that she was made to wear you know in terms of her fashion choice etc all of that was centered you know in a particular stereotype or sometimes against that stereotype. And it just made me think how, you know, and we've been talking about it, how unconsciously sometimes bias works, uh, even for us people when we are voting for, you know, our candidates. Um, and what I think is personally, uh, you know, we have a long way to go in terms of, you know, making this sweeping change in attitude or, the, you know, I think what is needed is, you know, it's a very daunting task because it's you, you, what you require is a sweeping change in perspective, a sweeping change in outlook for able to get over this unconscious bias, you know, to look at a candidate and look at them for their merits as opposed to anything else. Uh, so I just wanted to know your thoughts on it. And I know, like you said, you know, you said change comes, but it's a no hurry. And I think I, you know, I also like agree with that, but just generally your thoughts on that. She's an interesting case, Hillary Clinton, I think. Um, it's ironic, isn't it, that she was, as you say, carefully stage managed, mm -hmm. and her opponent was able to turn that so cleverly to his advantage. Fake Hillary, false Hillary, inauthentic Hillary. You know, it's sort of partly there are lots of stories or morals we can take from that. There's a, there's a damned if you do, damned if you don't. I think there is something about authenticity. Um, and there's a debate about how much authenticity matters in politics. Feels like we're in a moment that this, this mythical authenticity matters a great deal. And maybe that's an opportunity for women, that we can shed some of those identities which are predominantly manufactured and start speaking our minds and testing what happens. You know, what happens when I call out the Oscars being so white? What happens when I say me too? Well, maybe if I say me too, I've got a problem. Maybe if three billion people say me too, then the world has a problem. So I think we're at a time when we can start playing with some of this, testing and probing, and then adapting our response as people who live in public life, who want to be political, and see what happens. But we're not at a moment where we have to accept old tropes where we have to accept some form of inauthenticity in order to have a right to stand. That's not this moment. Brilliant. I think we have one last question just there. Yeah. 
I, I, I would, I probably, was that me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I wouldn't have put my hand up if I'd known I was no, no, the yeah, last question. <laughs> but um, I, the, so a lot of what we've been talking about has just reminded me of a incident that happened at a, I'm a postdoc here at the university, of an incident that happened uh, at a small seminar that was organized in my research center. And it involved some quite senior people in the world I research. And I was there as someone who, um, as a quite a junior person who worked on a project that was being discussed. And in the, during the, the bit where everyone introduces themselves at the beginning, it got to me and I said, I had a, a moment of crisis and said like, my name's Alice and um, I don't actually really know anything about what we're talking about today. And then it moved on and as soon as I said it, I thought what a stupid thing to say. I know I didn't actually know much about that topic, but I knew something. And for the entire rest of the meeting, I didn't say anything at all um, because I felt silly. And then at the end of the, uh, later that day or the next day or something, I bumped into the head of my research centre, who is a woman, who kind of said to me, oh, Alice, why did you, why did you say that? You should have said that you know all these things, blah, 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 blah. And that made me feel much worse <laughs> <laughs> because I already knew I'd messed up. And uh, I guess the, the point of that is just that, uh, that people sometimes, you sometimes get it wrong and that, that I think the kind of way of dealing with it is through kind of being generative, maybe. Like maybe if she'd noticed that, she could have yes. said at some point, Hey, Alice, what do you think about this? Rather yes. than make me feel stupid. Um, the question I have is partly related. Um, and it's to do with... I guess it's to do with um, trying to claim authority and the kind of complexities and guilt you can feel about doing that when some of the ways you claim it aren't fair, if you know what I mean. So I spent a lot of time today, too much time, working out if I should put... I was doing my email signature, working out if I should put a doctor before my name or not, mm -hmm. because... Are you a doctor? Mm -hmm. I haven't, haven't technically graduated, but I feel like <laughs> that's just because I haven't bothered with the ceremony. But it's like, I don't, I don't think someone should treat my email with more respect because I happen to get a PhD yes. in comparison to someone else, next person to me in my office, who maybe does exactly the same work or does equally important work or whatever. Yes. Yeah, this no, works. I understand, I understand. <laughs> and... Um, and I think being a politician, if I bring it back to that, being a member of parliament, um, at least speaking with female friends of my sort of age who are doing it, they say, you know, it's completely exposing in a way that is very frightening. There's nowhere to hide from past <coughs> indiscretions or from things that you don't know about, or you have to confront who you are. You have to be pretty darn sure about who you are. And that can come through a good grounding and a loving home, or it can come through a heck of a lot of work. Um, many of them will talk privately about doing work on themselves, you know, counselling and other forms, to be able to confront some of the narratives about themselves. Um, but then when they're through and they're in, I think predominantly it's a message of hope. Because when I speak with them about it, they say, I am my best self. I'm living the best life I can. Sure, it's painful. Sure, it's horrible when I get called out on things or um, I feel like I'm not getting that balance that you're talking about right between establishing my authority um, and feeling that what I am and, and, and who I am and what I have to say is enough. And that's a, that's a conversation with ourselves every day to make that choice. But what they do say is that they wouldn't trade it, that it's hard work, but it's worth it. Um, Barbara Follett MP once said to me, so she did a, a bit of mentoring for the Labour Women's Network that Joe and I were involved in, and she said, and this is back in the, the late 90s, she said, my name is Barbara Follett MP, I've been divorced four times. <laughs> but she said, I say that because I used to practice it in front of the mirror. My name is Barbara Follett MP, I've been divorced four times. Get me. <laughs> because it was used as a stick to beat her. And I think the problem is when you have a stick that is used to beat you and you pick up that stick and you beat yourself, or you turn it around and you say, actually, yeah, that stick is there. It's a stick, isn't it lovely? <laughs> <laughs> So 
sorry, just to close, I'd like to thank you all so much for coming. It's been a really great discussion. And of course, thank you most of all to Catherine. Um, we have drinks reception now for half an hour outside. So please do come and join and chat to anyone you want to. Thank you very much. Oh.